the the elephant's footprint can contain the footprints of all other animals that walk the earth. In the same way, the Buddha's teaching of the Four Noble Truths contains all other wholesome teachings of the Buddhas. Everything which he taught subsequently was an elaboration of or an explanation of the Four Noble Truths. So this sutta is given by Venerable Sariputta, not the Buddha himself, and he looks first at the Four Noble Truths and he takes only the first Noble Truth, the Noble Truth of Dukkha. And this is generally um, explained or defined as birth, sickness, old age, death, are dukkha. Pain, sorrow, woe, lamentation are also dukkha. To be separated from what one likes or to be united with what one does not like also dukkha, and um, not to get one want, what one wants is dukkha. But the last part of the definition is the five aggregates of clinging are dukkha. And this is what Venerable Sariputta takes from this first noble truth, the five aggregates of clinging. They're called Kanda, and the five are Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vijnana. Form, feeling, perception, mental formations, and consciousness. And of these five aggregates, Sariputta takes just one, which is Rupa, material form. And material form consists of four great elements and 24 derived elements. Has everybody got a copy of the table of the elements? So the four great elements are Patavi, Apo, Tejo, Vayo. Symbolically called earth, water, fire, and air. Or solidity, fluidity, heat, and motion. <coughs> and Venerable Sariputta takes the earth element. Part of it. And he talks about internal and external. Internal <coughs> are the parts of the body in which the earth element is predominant. And he has a list of the body parts. Normally, we regard these as mine. There are three things, tanha, mana, and diti, where we say, this is me, this is mine, this is myself. That's the element of clinging. This is why it's called the five aggregates of clinging. We cling on to the aggregates. But Sariputta now tries to help us to understand that these are simply material objects, not to be taken as me and mine. 
any more than we take external objects. We don't take uh, <clears throat> a metal like iron as me or mine. Same way we should try to develop this objective point of view regarding the internal material elements. Uh, in the Vasudhi Magga, Buddha Gosa gives the, the analogy of a man <coughs> who was very devoted, very attached to his wife. But once he has divorced his wife, he has no more attachment. He doesn't have any strong feelings about what happens or what the wife does or ex-wife does. He's dissociated himself. Sariputta then shows that the earth element <coughs> is impermanent. He talks about the destruction of the world. The earth element is destroyed. Well, if the whole world can be destroyed, then what about something as small and insignificant as our little body? That can also be destroyed. But it is arisen due to conditioning. Everything arises due to conditioning. And the Paticca Samupada, the doctrine of dependent origination, shows us how material form arises. If we can develop equanimity towards these material objects, not taking them as me or mine, then the material form, the, the body, is not affected by either physical or verbal abuse because we have equanimity. If we don't have equanimity, then we can develop the quality called Sanvega. And Vega is given two meanings. The Buddha himself <coughs> spoke about places of religious emotion, or what we now call places of pilgrimage. In the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, he talks about four places of pilgrimage. You remember those four? Isipatana, mm -hmm. yes, where, where he gave his first sermon, but before that, Lumbini, where he was born, that's right, yes. He was born in Lumbini, that's the first place. Buddha Gaya, right where he became enlightened. And Isipatana, where, or Varanasi, where he gave the first sermon. And the fourth place, Kusinara, where he passed away. That's right. So that's four places about which we can develop uh, religious emotion. Buddha Gosa gives <coughs> uh, a slightly different definition of Sanvega, which we could call um, a sense of urgency. When we are aware of birth, old age, sickness, and death. And then we're also aware of the suffering of rebirth in the lower states of existence, the suffering <coughs> of the past rooted in the cycle of rebirth, the suffering <coughs> in the future rooted in the cycle of rebirth, and the suffering in the present, rooted in the search for food, if we, if we are developing all of these eight, then we can develop a sense of urgency to do whatever we can now to 
learn the Buddha's Dhamma and to practice the Buddha's Dhamma because we don't want to endure more birth, old age, sickness, death and other forms of suffering. So this is a, a wake-up call. So Sariputta says all of this with reference to the material form, part of the, and then he goes on to say the same things with reference to the other three great elements, water, fire and air. Any questions about that? Because that's more or less what we covered last week. Anybody got a, a question? Any clear? Okay. Now, the impersonal nature of these elements was also explained by the Buddha himself in a discourse he had with his son Rahula. He said, Rahula, the internal earth element and the external earth element are just the earth element. This should be seen as it really is with correct wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. That's Tanha Mana Diti. Having seen this thus as it really is with correct wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element. One detaches the mind from the earth element. So as long as we are attached to the earth element, as, as long as there is clinging to the earth element, the First Noble Truth tells us that's a form of dukkha. So if we can detach ourselves, no longer clinging to the earth element, then we are free from that form of dukkha. And then when the Buddha has said the same thing with reference to the other three main elements. He goes on, When Rahula, a bhikkhu does not recognize a self or the belongings of a self in these four elements, he is called a bhikkhu who has cut off craving, stripped off the fetters, remember the ten fetters which hold back our progress towards Nibbana, and by completely breaking through conceit, he has made an end of suffering. So, Sariputta has been using the attachment or the clinging to material form as an example of suffering and how if we can re eliminate the clinging, then we have eliminated that form of dukkha. Okay. So let's pick up from, uh, I think it's verse 26, talking about the space element. So this is the space element. If you look on your chart of the elements, it's number 19 in the table, uh, the 28 forms of, of, uh, of uh, Rupa is number 19, which is the space element. <coughs> Go ahead. Friends, just as when a space is enclosed by timber, grass and clay, it comes to be termed house. So too, when a space is enclosed by bones, and sinews, flesh and skin, it comes to be termed material form, that means a body. We have a concept of a cow, but he makes the point that when the cow has been cut apart, cut up by the cow butcher or the cow butcher's apprentice, where's the cow gone? 
The car was simply a concept which had no independent existence. It was just a collection of bits, legs and head, tail, bits of body, so forth. We might say the same today, that you would take a car. A car has no independent existence as a car. It's simply a collection of, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of parts put together in a particular way, we end up with a car. And that's, that's fine, we talk about a car, we talk about a cow, but it's simply a concept. It has no real existence. And so, Sariputta here is taking the example of a body, the human body, compared with a house. And then, when space is enclosed by various uh, parts, constituent parts, we end up with either uh, a house or a body. But again, it's helping us to understand the impersonal nature of the body. Then he goes on now to look at this in more detail with reference to dependent origination. That's verse 27. <coughs> Thank you. If, friends, internally <coughs> the eye is intact, but no external forms come into its range, and there is no corresponding conscious engagement, then there is no manifestation for the corresponding class of consciousness. The eye has to be in proper working order. Then we have to have an external object, a visible object. And then there has to be what is called here corresponding conscious engagement. The word is manasikara. It was expressed uh, in the Madhupindika Sutta as um, dependent on the eye and forms, eye consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. That's fasa. And then, with contact as condition, there is feeling. What one feels, one perceives. What one perceives, one thinks about. What one thinks about, one mentally proliferates. What a person mentally proliferates is the source through which perceptions and notions due to mental proliferation impacts one regarding past, future and present forms. So there are three things which have to come together. In the first example, we've got the eye is intact, but there are no external forms and there's no corresponding conscious engagement, no coming together, no fasa. intact, and external forms come into it in rage, but there is no corresponding conscious engagement, then there is no manifestation of the corresponding class of consciousness. But when internally the eye is intact, and external forms come into rage, and there is the corresponding conscious engagement, then there is the manifestation of the corresponding class of consciousness. <coughs> the material form in what has thus come to be is included in the material form aggregate affected by clinging. So what, sorry, what is, doing? is to go through these various um, objects, the material form and so forth, and showing that that is one of the aggregates affected by clinging. We cling on to this, taking it as me or mine or myself. And he's showing here that this aspect of the first noble truth is being explained as clinging to the 
aggregates specifically clinging to material form. Has come to be is included in the feeling aggregate affected by clinging. The perception in what has thus come to be is included in the perception aggregate affected by clinging. The formations in what has thus come to be is included in the formations aggregate affected by clinging. The consciousness in what has thus come to be is included in the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. He understands thus, this indeed is how there comes to be the inclusion, gathering and amassing of things into these five aggregates affected by clinging. <coughs> Now this has been said by the Blessed One. One who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. One who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. I've been told that this statement of the Buddhas is not found anywhere in the Pali Canon. It's only in this sutta where Sariputta is quoting from the Buddha that we find this statement. It's in fact one of the, one of the Buddha's best known statements, pointing out that the Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination, is central to his whole teaching. It's central to the Dhamma. If you see and understand the Paticca Samuppada, then you've understood the Dhamma. But <laughs> we have no actual record of this being said by the Buddha. But of course we don't think that Sani Putta made this up. It's just that we don't have a specific reference. Five aggregates affected by clinging are dependently arisen. The desire, indulgence, inclination and holding based on these five aggregates affected by clinging is the origination of suffering. The removal of desire and lust and abandonment of desire and lust for these five aggregates affected by clinging is the cessation of suffering. At this point, too, friends, much has been done by that bhikkhu. Well, the cessation of suffering refers to <coughs> Nibbana. This whole sutta is now explaining that it is the attachment or the clinging to material form which is responsible for the arising of suffering and if we can abandon this attachment to material form then it is the elimination of suffering. So this is what the, this is the, the central part of this sutta. Now, the next few stanzas are simply a repetition of what we've just looked at, except in number 29, it is the ear he's talking about. If friends internally, the ear is, an, is intact. And then on 31, if internally, the nose is intact. And then 33, if the tongue is intact. 35, if the body is intact. The text is the same in each case. But if you'd like to read from 37, please. But no external mind objects come into this its range and there is no corresponding conscious engagement, then there is no manifestation of the corresponding class of consciousness. If internally the mind is intact and external mind objects come into its range, but there is no corresponding conscious engagement, then there is no manifestation of the corresponding class of consciousness. But that, that means that maybe there is a familiar object which we perceive, but because we say, oh, I've, I've seen this, I know what it is, we don't actually perceive the details. 
with, uh, with reference to that particular object. Mind is intact and the external mind objects come into its range and there is the con corresponding conscious engagement. Then there is the manifestation of the corresponding class of consciousness. The material form in what has thus come to be is included in the material form aggregate affected by clinging. The feeling in what has thus come to be is included in the feeling aggregate affected by clinging. The perception in what has thus come to be is included in the perception aggregate affected by clinging. The formations in what has thus come to be is included in the formations aggregate affected by clinging. The consciousness in what has thus come to be is included in the consciousness aggregate affected by Kini. He understands thus. This indeed is how there comes to be the inclusion, gathering and amassing of things into these five aggregates affected by clinging. Now this has been said by the Blessed One. One who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma. One who sees the Dhamma sees dependent origination. And these five aggregates affected by clinging are dependently arisen. The desire, indulgence, inclination and holding based on these five aggregates affected by clinging is the origination of suffering. The removal of desire and lust, the abandonment of desire and lust for these five aggregates affected by clinging is the cessation of suffering. At this point, too, friends, much has been done by that bhikkhu. That is what the Venerable Sariputta said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Venerable Sariputta's words. Are you also satisfied and delighted? <coughs> yes. Yes. Why is it wrong to kill the cow if it's not a cow? <laughs> It is just a concept. It is a concept. But the cow, um, well, there are two reasons why it's wrong to kill. First is the cow can experience pain, and you're going to cause pain to the cow because the cow is not an enlightened being and it cannot observe pain objectively as, say, the Buddha. Good. And the second reason is that by killing the cow you are generating aversion in your mind, which is an unskillful state of mind. You have an aversion to the continued existence of the cow. And that is an unskillful state of mind. So the killing of the cow is hurtful to the cow and damaging to your own state of mind. It's how that is perceived by both parties that makes it wrong. Even though it's an illusion, the concept of the cow is an illusion, yes. but the, the feelings are real, the pain is real, and the, yes. and the damaging effects on our own mental sort of development are real. Yes, because we're generating aversion or, uh, in the extreme form, hatred. <coughs> mind. Dosa is the, you know, the party word, Loba Dosa Mosa. <coughs> no. So by, by developing Dosa, that's an unskillful state of mind. Mm. And we should not be trying to generate that, we should be trying to generate the opposite, Adosa. Yeah. Okay. So here we talk about the eye being intact and being able to come into, into the range, something coming in its range, which then creates the, the mental formation. Yeah. But aren't there planes where there are no material uh, contacts? So, and, and in, in that situation, is there clinging in those planes? My understanding is okay. there is. Well, the string, but not... There's not that particular form of clinging, because that particular aggregate is not there. So, uh, in this case, yeah, the, the, the eye is, is working. When it says intact, it means that it, it, it's not blind. If, if, if the eye is blind, you can say the, the eye is not intact. But in this case, in the human plane, 
if the eye is intact, then when a suitable object comes along, there can be contact, fassa, between the two. And that gives rise to the eye consciousness. But, you, but in certain higher planes, you're, you are correct, that would not be uh, found. In a plane where there is no material uh, matter, there is still attachment, or...? There can be attachment to non material things. Uh, there can be attachment to all sorts of um, things which are not um, part of, say, the, the, the body, uh, or which are not uh, a material thing. We can be attached to the, the, the enjoyable state in which we find ourselves. Um, the, these heavenly states are supposed to be very pleasant. That's why they're called heavenly states. And there can be attachment to those. But it's not coming through, it's not a bodily experience. Or Bhavatanga would be a, a predominant factor there. Yes. Bhavatanga. Indeed, that's, that's not a, there's nothing material there. It's the, it's the desire to continue. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, the desire for continuity, for continuing in, in, in life. 